who should we trust for accurate health information? Uh, consumers are, are confused about what is good health information, what is, uh, what is a good diet to follow. Uh, and I can totally understand that if someone is not really deeply working in this area, it can be very confusing. Uh, we're dealing with a very complicated area and there are in general no really simple answers here uh, that there, uh, to be healthy, I describe it like a symphony orchestra. We need all the pieces there and we need them in the right balance. There's no just one instrument that's gonna carry the day. And so we've got to have all parts of our diet aligned, uh, uh, healthy types of fat in our diet, uh, good carbohydrate sources, healthy, uh, plant, uh, healthy protein sources, mainly emphasizing uh, plant, uh, plant-based sources, but not necessarily exclusively uh, having plant-based sources of protein. Uh, these and other components of the diet all need to be present and in the right balance. Where can consumers go to get accurate information about uh, their diet? Uh, that's a tough issue because we're bombarded from every type of media every day about what we should eat or what we shouldn't eat. Uh, uh, oftentimes, it's the least reliable information that we get in our news because it's often the latest study uh, may be inconsistent with many uh, better, bigger studies that have gone before. Uh, the man bite dog story uh, gets the headlines. The dog biting man uh, story doesn't get the headlines and that uh, dog biting man is likely to be more reliable information. So everybody's trying to feed in, get our attention. Sometimes it's with commercial interest uh, and behind them. Uh, there's a lot of distortion of the information that people are getting because of economic interests. Uh, th uh, there's no simple answer to that. We have tried to do our best. Uh, we have a website called Nutrition Source. If you just Google Nutrition Source, you will take it to the Harvard Department of Nutrition uh, website where we uh, try to have up-to-date stories, but put them into context of a lot of information that we've known over the past uh, few decades, that we've had available to us over the last few decades. Uh, in general, it's good not to be changing your behavior just by the one latest study, but to look at all of that, uh, all, all the literature on that topic in context. What studies have you been involved with and what were the results of those mm -hmm. studies? Uh, most of my own work has been within the context of several very large prospective cohort studies, the Nurses' Health Study, the Nurses' Health Study Two, and the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study. We started collecting data first in 1980 in the Nurses' Health Study from uh, about 100,000 registered nurses across the country. And these nurses have been amazing. Uh, about 90%, even after four decades, have still been actively participating uh, in, the, in the study. And compared to other studies, we didn't just get dietary information at one point in time. We've updated that dietary information every four years as we've gone along. And of course, we're keeping track of pretty much everything we could think that might be related to the health. That would include smoking, uh, physical activity, use of different medications, family history of diseases. So when we want to look at something like uh, fruits and vegetables, we can adjust statistically for that, uh, all of those other risk factors that might be related to diet. There's, no, there's never going to be any perfect ideal study of diet and health. Uh, that in principle would mean randomizing tens of thousands of people to follow one diet or another diet and keep them on those diets for decades to see the long-term consequences. Uh, that's uh, just not practical. People have tried to do such types of studies and uh, people are people and not everybody sticks, uh, sticks to the diet to which they're assigned. And that can really obscure any uh, benefits, any true benefits that might be there. So uh, in, in many ways, our studies are the most detailed long-term studies overall. We're uh, tracking uh, uh, about 250,000 people now up to about four decades. Uh, uh, but it's also very useful to do short-term studies uh, looking at risk factors for these for major events like cancer and cardiovascular disease. Uh, these short-term studies may be just a few dozen people uh, put on say low red meat or high red meat diets and then we can see over the next few weeks what happens to their blood cholesterol levels. And we have seen that compared to plant-based protein sources, red meat does elevate LDL, the bad cholesterol in the blood. 
And so when we put that together with long-term studies uh, showing that people who consume high amounts of red meat uh, compared to those who consume low amounts of red meat and more healthy plant-based protein sources, the, the, high med, the high red meat group has higher rates of heart disease. Uh, that combination of the short-term studies looking at intermediate risk factors and the long-term studies looking at the diseases that we really want to prevent, when we have those showing results in the same direction, we can be much more confident about the findings. In our long-term studies, we've looked at pretty much every disease outcome you can imagine. Now, we've published uh, several thousand papers uh, looking at so many different issues. Uh, in a very broad sense, we do see that people uh, eating dietary patterns uh, like the Mediterranean, traditional Mediterranean diet, but consistent with other largely plant-based diets, have uh, better health outcomes across the board and longer life expectancy. Why don't medical doctors speak to their patients more about diet and nutrition? Unfortunately, medical doctors often don't speak to their patients about diet, uh, which is uh, unfortunate because diet is probably the most single important risk factor in terms of uh, disease prevention. Uh, a lot of that relates to the fact that doctors, myself included, were given very little nutrition information during our training. And uh, even if we were, in fact, it would by uh, my own at least, it would be pretty out of date uh, because things have uh, moved pretty fast in this area during the last decade or two. But even today, when we know a lot more about nutrition, we know how important it is, still doctors rarely talk to their patients about nutrition. Uh, doctors are under a lot of pressure these days uh, to see a lot of patients in a short period of time. Uh, so they feel uh, that they don't have t often don't have time to speak to them about their diets. Uh, they're still largely not confident in their own minds about what they know and don't know about nutrition. Uh, there's no uh, very rarely compensation for uh, being paid through insurance uh, policies for sitting down with their patients, learning about what they're eating, what the problems might be in their diet, and making uh, giving informed guidance. Uh, but uh, even if they don't have so much time, uh, a quick message uh, about some of the most important aspects of diet and possibly referral to a dietitian or nutrition counselor uh, could be very important. But if there's not compensation for that, uh, then uh, doctors and uh, nutrition counselors, dietitians, uh, uh, have a hard time providing that information. So the whole system uh, is weighted against prevention in general, but uh, in particular uh, weighted against giving uh, adequate nutrition counseling to patients. In chapter three of Eat, Drink, and Be Healthy, what did you mean by what can you believe about diet? Yeah. In this chapter, in Eat, Drink, and Be Healthy, uh, we discuss the uh, challenges that the average person has in finding reliable nutrition information because we are bombarded by uh, nutrition uh, dietary information from multiple directions uh, every day, newspapers, online, uh, TV, <coughs> uh, television. And uh, it's very, uh, it's sure to be confusing for someone uh, who is not familiar with the literature in a very deep way. Uh, even myself, this, the many issues are complicated, sometimes not always crystal clear. Uh, and if you don't have a really solid background, uh, it's very hard to separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of the information that we get. A lot of that information is disinformation, purposeful disinformation from vested interests. Uh, the soda industry, uh, for example, uh, fast food industry, are trying to sow confusion and disinformation, uh, uh, that uh, even if their conclusion is not that we should drink a lot of soda, but just that we don't know, that's good enough for them. So go ahead and drink as much as you want to, or eat a lot as, red, as much red meat as you want to, because it doesn't make any difference and the science is too weak. They're satisfied with confusion and disinformation. And a lot of uh, parts of the industry are out there trying to sow uh, confusion and disinformation. Uh, Therefore, it's, a, it's challenging for the average person. Uh, we've uh, tried to deal with this. Uh, other groups have. Uh, we have a website, Nutrition Source. Uh, just go to Google, uh, put in Nutrition Source or Harvard, and it will take you there. Uh, we, we do our best to keep that up to date and uh, science-based, uh, not influenced by economic interest.